It is often said that no one can fulfill the law. But Yahshua the Messiah gave us a commandment that is much more difficult than these. Welcome to Revealing the Truth. I'm John Fisher and with me is David Brett. And I made the statement in the opening that, um, that many, many uh, people are teaching that the law, the law of Yahweh, although a lot of times they call it the law of Moses, is uh, impossible to fulfill. And, and then I said that the Messiah, Yahshua, gave us a commandment that was even more difficult than these. And um, I, I suppose uh, that we'd have to help people understand that the commandments were given to us, and, I, and I'm speaking primarily of the Ten Commandments, but mm -hmm. I'm including the whole uh, Torah, the prophets, and the writings. Mm -hmm. All of these are by the inspiration of Yahweh, as is the Brit Chadashah, the New Testament. Yeah, the Ten Commandments are basically, in a nutshell, a condensed, right. I think, version of what basically we need to really be right. focusing on. Right. And, and so I, I suppose that I would have to first convince you that, that we can do the Ten Commandments. Um, I mean, how, how often do you go out into the woods and chop down a tree and make an idol out of it and bow down to it? Well, people don't do that typically. People um, typically don't make um, statues, you know, uh, things that resemble things in the heavens and the, on the earth and underneath the earth to bow down and worship to. Mm -hmm. That's basically the second one. Um, yeah, Yahweh wants all of our worship to be about Him. Um, the third commandment is to do not ruin the name of Yahweh. I know it says, do not take the name of, quote, the Lord in vain, but that those two words, the Lord, in, where Lord is in all caps, that is the name of Yahweh. It's been covered up almost 7,000 times. Scripture is clear that um, you cannot with any authority, take out the name, uh, take out anything in the scripture and put something in its place. Well, almost 7,000 times uh, the translators of um, the Tanakh have changed the name of Yahweh. They've, they've taken the name in vain. In vain means ruin, to bring to nothingness. Do not bring the name of Yahweh to nothingness is what that verse means. And um, we're not fanatics about using the name of Yahweh, but we understand that His name, the, the word name, is equivalent to His authority. His name is His authority, just as ours is. When we buy something, we have to sign our name to it. Mm -hmm. We can't just say, you know, the person who lives at 906, whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. we, we sign our name. That is our th authority and our responsibility. Um, the fourth commandment, we do that every Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week. That is a commandment that anyone can do. M many people don't. But is it impossible? No. Can we honor our father and our mother? Well, we can. It's not impossible. I, we see people loving their parents many, many times in, in our lives. Um, is it, can we keep from killing other people? <laughs> Can we keep from um, uh, committing adultery? And that doesn't just mean between two people, right? Two married people, one of them has an affair. Yeah, that is adultery, and, and that is the, the physical um, representation of that commandment. But it also means do not adulterate the word of Yahweh. Uh, because we see that, you know, committing adultery with, with stones and, and, and lumber. You know? Yeah, could almost have, a that, yeah. Of, almost have a figurative sense of idolatry. Right. Uh, you know, putting something between you and Yahweh that keeps you mm -hmm. from Yahweh. Right. You know, like, right. You know, it could be anything. I mean, your hobbies could mm -hmm. be so overwhelming that you spend all your time with those right. and nothing and, with Yahweh. And when the scripture talks about Israel, um, you know, 
sleeping with other nations. They're, they're basically, that's a reference to them taking up the ways of other nations. Um, can we um, prevent ourselves from lying to one another? Um, in other words, bearing false witness. Can we, can, mm -hmm. we, can we speak the truth? Yes, we can. A lot of people don't know how to do that because they're too afraid that if they tell the truth, they're going to hurt other people or that when they say the truth, other people are going to hurt them. Mm -hmm. And can we prevent ourselves from lusting after other people's possessions? Yeah. So um, those and any other commandments um, are given to us. We can do them, or else why would Yahweh give them to us if we could not do them? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yashua, but, it, oh, but in the New Testament, it says just <laughs> honor your father and, and love your neighbor as yourself, or essentially. Well, so, yeah. Like, um, those, so those are the two commandments now. I think it's about six that so are So there's no longer <laughs> ten, there's only two. Well, if you oh, actually you take away those two, you only have one, love, just love. Yeah. But, you know, that's in order. I mean, you can't take away the others and have those two being done. And, and you can't take away those two and have the one done mm -hmm. properly. Right. You know, I can't, you know, I'm not loving you if I commit adultery with your wife. It's just exactly. ignorant right. to think that. Right. And people so. make that mistake because they mistranslate the word fulfill. Fulfill does not mean end. I mean, when Yahshua said, uh, do not even think that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill the law and the prophets. Fulfill, I mean, if it meant to destroy, he'd say, I did not come to destroy the law and the prophets. I've come to destroy the law and the prophets. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't. What's the opposite of destroy? To build up, mm -hmm. to fulfill, which, which actually uh, means to verify to, to bring to your mind a picture of what it, it means to obey the commandments of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. But this talk is not about that. <laughs> this talk is about the commandment that He gave that is very difficult for us to, uh, to, to do. Let me read that for you in Matthew 5, beginning at verse 43, where it says, and this is Joshua speaking, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. That's a commandment. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons or children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son, S-U-N, rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. In verse 46, For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, I guess being perfect might, <laughs> might be one of those impossible things to achieve, but the word perfect does not mean to be the, the, that, that end goal <laughs> that you're shooting for. It, it essentially means to work toward that. That's what the word there in, in the Greek means. But the commandment that he's giving that to love your enemies, how do we do that? How do we um, listen to someone, maybe someone that we've come to trust, and hear harsh words spoken to us? I mean, in, in this society, how many marriages end up in divorce? Well, uh, 60%. Roughly, yeah. Uh, six, For America. Six out of every 10 marriages end up in divorce? Why? Well, because when, when people come together and they begin to trust one another, they you know, consume that, uh, that relationship and marry and raise a family. But we get angry and we say things to hurt the other person. And typically what it is is that we want the other person to be like we want them to be, not like they want them to be. Mm -hmm. So we say things to them. We judge them and threaten and blame and issue commands and make demands. and. Uh, we use put downs. We do all kinds of things to the people that we care about to get them to be like we want them to be. 
we're very proud people. Mm -hmm. we, we, like uh, Lucifer, we wanted to be the one in control. We also want that. That's part of our flesh. And so people who love one another, when, when they say those things, we take them very personally. They have deep meaning for us. The truth is that what they say is not about us. It's really something going on for them that they really don't know how to tell us. Um, that's a whole other story. So what do we do when someone judges us? Well, we judge them. When someone blames us, we blame them. When someone threatens us, we threaten them to, to protect our own sense of power and control. Mm. Doesn't work though, because once we judge someone that we love, I mean, they're taking it very personally. And they're feeling, I mean, what's the purpose of judging someone? To make them feel what? Ashamed and guilty. When we threaten someone, we want them to feel afraid. When we command and make demands of someone, we want them to feel powerless. Why? So that they'll do what we want them to do. We become enemies, launching verbal missiles to one another, mm. shooting each other down. So how do we do that? I mean, that, that's a real serious problem. I and mean, take a look at the world today. How many enemies do we have in the world? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can say that, you can say that about any nation. This world is in a, uh, yeah. a whole Well, whole right now we have a nation <laughs> rising up against nation. Right. And that's foretold in Scripture. So I think we're in a very serious time period right. in history. So how, how in this world, well, actually maybe that's an interesting question. How in this world do we live up to this commandment that Yahshua has given to us mm -hmm. to love our enemies? I don't think that's on our minds much. And yet he commands us to do that. <clears throat> So I wonder, is this a New Testament thing? Is this brand new that we should love our enemies? Is it something that the, the scriptures, um, you know, the Tanakh, the, the prophets and the, the writings in the Tanakh, do they give witness to that? Well, we one place that we see some evidence, um, not for that, but to hate our, our enemies is in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 3 through 5, where it says, An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter the assembly of Yahweh. Even to the tenth generation, none of his descendants shall enter the assembly of Yahweh forever, because they did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt, and because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, from Petor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. Nevertheless, Yahweh your Elohim would not listen to Balaam, but Yahweh your Elohim turned the curse into a blessing for you because Yahweh your Elohim loves you. And then verse 6, you shall not seek their peace nor their prosperity all your days forever. And there are other places in Scripture as well that reflect this message, both in uh, the book of Ezra and the, Be and the book of Nehemiah. And uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about um, some more of verses that might look like we're commanded to hate our enemies. But there's also evidence to the other side. Who has ascended into heaven and descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped the waters in his garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name or his son's name, if thou canst tell? Hello, I'm Carrie Brett with Yahweh's Assembly in Yahshua. Learn more about the importance of the divine names of our Heavenly Father and His Son, as well as getting better insight of the scriptures that will help you to learn biblical truth. Request our free literature, Discovering the Name of Yahshua in the King James Bible, and the Hebrew Aramaic origin of the New Testament. To receive your free literature, visit us online at www.yaiy.org. You can also write to Y-A-I-Y, 2963 County Road 233, Kingdom City, Missouri, 65262. Or call us toll free at 1-877-642-4101. We're discussing the commandment, essentially, that Yahshua gave to us that we should love our enemies. Um, re referencing um, people having heard that you shall love Yahweh, but hate your enemies. 
And we looked at some of the scriptures that uh, one might construe the meaning that we should hate our enemies. Mm -hmm. But I, I also suggested that there are places in the Old Testament where um, it uh, suggests the opposite. But first I wanted to look at... Um, so does that mean that there's a conflict in Scripture? <laughs> <laughs> or no. maybe it's just how we are, we're looking at it and we're not understanding it to the depth that we need to. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it has always been a part of the law that anyone who wants to worship Yahweh can come in to Israel. That has always been the case. But it's those who defiantly raise a hand against Yahweh, against His ways, that is their promise that they will be cursed. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately that means they won't receive eternal life. Um, and the, the New Testament simply just validates that mm -hmm. with, the, with the Messiah coming and demonstrating what it looks like to live eternally, the, yeah. to come up from the grave. In fact, Messiah basically speaks the words of the Old Testament to teach exactly. all ways. Exactly, yeah. and that's what we want to look at here. In the, in the book of Luke, uh, in chapter 10, beginning at verse 25, we read, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, this is a very key, a good answer in the form of a question. What is written in the law? Is, wow. is Joshua a law abiding person? Absolutely. Yeah. And he's looking at, and he's speaking to this person and saying, You want an answer? Go look in the law. Mm -hmm. What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? Now, that's a different question because everyone reads the scripture out of the experiences that they've had in their own lives. And so in a sense, every time we read Scripture, even if it's the same Scripture that we're all reading, we, we receive it differently. We put different meanings onto the words. So he asks, you know, what does the law say? And then, what do you say? <laughs> What's your interpretation of it? And so he answered and said, you shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart. This is the man answering that. With all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he, Yahshua, said to him, you have answered rightly, do this and you will live. So this is the formula for um, eternal life. He's giving it to us. And what is it? To love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Then he goes on, um, and the story might have ended there, but it doesn't. The, the man then asks, um, wanting to justify himself in verse 29, said to Yahshua, and who is my neighbor? <laughs> I suppose that he was expecting Yahshua to say, well, certainly not the Samaritans, <laughs> or certainly not the Moabites, but this is what he said. Then Yahshua answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, he's giving a story, and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest, someone from the uh, tribe of Levi, came down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, perhaps not a priest, but still of the tribe, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. Verse 33, but a certain Samaritan, Okay, now who are the Samaritans? They are people who are despised by the, the people of Judea as, as Gentiles. In truth, they are the northern tribes that were dispersed by Syria and have lost their way. They're the lost sheep of the house of Israel, at any rate. Um, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. The word compassion means with pain. So he saw the pain and he probably in his life had experienced that pain. He had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him and whatever, whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. And then Yahshua says to the man, so which of these do you think was neighbor 
to him who fell among the thieves. And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Yahshua said to him, go and do likewise. There's something just uh, so overpowering in those words. Who is my neighbor? Well, it's someone even who hates me, someone who despises me, won't even come and sit with me at a meal. Where do these verses come from? And as Joshua was pointing to, uh, they come from the law. What law is that? Well, it's in a number of places, but Leviticus 19 verse 18 demonstrates that fairly clearly. Leviticus 19 verse 18 says, You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, um, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. And of course, um, in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, um, which, which uh, we're going to get to shortly here. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's also interesting that, you know, when, when we look at the New Testament, mm -hmm. the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy, for example, in 1 Timothy 4 and verse uh, 13, well, let's go back to 12. 1 Timothy 4 and, and verse 12 says, Let no one look down on, on you on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, purity. Show yourself an example to those who believe. Is that it? Just have love, faith? What does that purity mean? Look at verse 13. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Hmm. Now, to show love, to show these type of things, uh, certainly the Spirit, I think, is involved when, we, when we're immersed into Yahshua's name and receive that. But where do our teachings come from, and, and, and where do we get insight into what the Spirit is helping us with today? Isn't it from the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. And that's where Timothy was to go. That's where the Apostle Paul told Timothy to go and read and teach out of. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we have to understand is sin was not tolerated in the assemblies. And Timothy is told, even the elders who continue in sin, rebuke them in front of everybody. He says that in verse 20 of 1 Timothy 4. says, those elders basically who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all, so that the rest will fear, be fearful of sinning. And sinning is the transgression of Yahweh's law. We find in 1 John 3, 4, it's clearly defined. Mm -hmm. So what are we talking about here? <laughs> We're talking about loving one another the way Yahweh wants us to love one another. Mm -hmm. And that's according to his instructions. Absolutely. Which includes the Ten Commandments. Right. And um, I didn't point out when we were uh, reading from Matthew 22, the man who um, Joshua asked, what, is the, what does it say in the law, was quoting directly from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6 um, and uh, beginning of verse 4. Um, he didn't include the first verse here, but it says, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh, um, our Elohim, Yahweh is one. You shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And then, you know, we, we, people will talk about how, you know, well, you can't, you can't work your way into heaven. Well, actually, we're not going to heaven anyway. Heaven's <laughs> coming down. Uh, right. But then it says, um, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. The Old Testament is, does not neglect the importance of the law being in our heart. And in fact, that's what Jeremiah 31, 31 and following tells us that the New Testament, the New Covenant, will be that the law is placed in our heart and in our minds that we might do it. Mm -hmm. okay? yeah. So for us, there's, there's no um, conflict there. Yeah, Ecclesiastics, uh, I'm sorry, Ezekiel. 36, uh, 26, I'll, I'll just okay. uh, go there real quick. 26, uh, 36 talks about um, what was happening today, uh, what happened at the start of Pentecost in the New Testament 
at, on Acts, in Acts chapter, um, chapter 2, and we find that Ezekiel, I'm sorry, 36, 26. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is repeated in, in Jeremiah 31, mm -hmm. uh, 31 there. Actually, when you start reading the scripture, it's there everywhere you read, mm -hmm. it's in, the, in the Tanakh and in, in the New Testament. Um, in Galatians, Paul uh, uh, writes in uh, chapter 5, beginning at verse 14, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, one statement. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But he warns, and this is kind of goes back to when we, when we first started talking about, if, if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you, cons or you be consumed by one another. So there's, there's a, an important reason why we are to love even those that we you know, consider to be our enemies. Um, because if we do that, not only do we destroy the relationship, but we end up destroying ourselves. Because ultimately, I believe most people have a good moral character. They know what is right and what is wrong. And if we, not even consciously, but under, understands at some degree that we've done something wrong, we're going to feel guilty. And uh, calling people names, uh, judging them, threatening, blaming them, all this stuff, we know down deep is something wrong. We create guilt and shame and fear and powerlessness by doing that. There is so much in the scripture. I want to leave you with a one verse though. It's, in, it's found in the book of Luke. Chapter 23, beginning at verse 32. There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. This is the, the impalement, the execution of Joshua. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they executed him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Joshua said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And many times we think that he is speaking about uh, the world. But is he speaking about the world or is he speaking about those two? Or is he speaking specifically about those who have ensured that he would die? He forgave. He asked the Father to forgive. And that is what he's asking us to do to those people who are despitefully use us.